Aloha mai kako and welcome to another episode of Aloha Authentic with Kamakapili. Um, my name hasn't changed, it's still Kamakapili. Uh, I want to just be able to share this. This show is about sharing artists and the art and the work and the stories that they put into their work. Um, so th thank you very much for, for um, tuning in today. Our artist and special guest for today is sixth generation Lauhala weaver, Keowa Nelson. Welcome to the show, brother. Hello. Mahalo nui. Thanks for having me on the oh, show. Oh, thank you. Um, bef before we get into talking story with Keowa, um, if you haven't seen last episode last month, we talked to a um, very special funny man himself, Uncle Walter Kawaiaia, who is the protege of the late, great Kahawanu Lake. That was a really cool episode to listen to what he had to share in context of aloha when it came to Hawaiian music. Um, before we get into talking with Keo and the whole practice of lauhala weaving, we have poke and we have poi on the table. The whole point of this, if it gets distracting, kalamai, but the whole point of an open bowl on the table, growing up for me, my tutu always said, when the bowl of poi is open on the table at dinner time, there is no um, negativity that is spoken. You know, there is no... Um, everything that comes out in all the mana that has been shared is all positive and is about healing and is about creation and is about just continuing you know the, the life that's on the table so the poi on the table today is representing that that everything that we're talking about is going to be all pono it's going to be all about aloha so i hope you enjoy it um getting straight into it sixth generation yeah no hollow weaver i can only imagine how many stories that has been told to you and that you can be able yeah. to share um how so it's sixth generation, but how deep does, does this practice of lauhala weaving really go into your family? Actually, it goes pretty deep, um, but as far as weaving, um, I just remember my great-grandmother and my grandmother weaving, um, and all of her sisters. So, you know, there's mm. a time when my grandmother and all of her sisters sat on our front porch, and all they would do all day is clean lauhala and weave. Mm. Um, which is interesting, is even though I'm sixth generation, I actually haven't only been weaving until like six or seven years ago. Wow. So, you know, Hawaiians believe they come on Ava Kupono, right? And yeah. for me, when grandma tried to teach me when I was in college, I just couldn't get it. Yeah. I, she sat me down and says, boy, come here, learn this. And it just wasn't working. So I said, that's okay, grandma. I just go clean lauhala for you. Go clean and prep and you guys just sit and weave. Yeah. You know, and so um, just growing up, we grew up like going camping with the specific reason for picking lauhala. Mm -hmm. And you're talking piles and piles and piles of lauhala that we just mm -hmm. sat there and cleaned. Wow. Yeah. And how long was how long was that phase for you of just focusing on that part of you know, the because practice? at that time I was in college. So every time I came home for summer or you know, spring break, yeah. That's when I would just go sit and just go clean, clean low hollow for grandma. Right. And um, every day on the, the porch mm. in nothing but low hollow rolls, low hollow products, a low hollow hats, mats, baskets, you name it, they wove it. Mm -hmm. They wove it. And that was their practice of yeah. sustaining themselves? It was their practice for sustaining themselves. One of the things that my grandmother always told me is, as a young child, they would come home from school, and my great-grandmother would make them sit down and weave. Mm -hmm. So my grandma would, my great-grandma would actually make the, the paw of the hat, and then they would actually have to weave down the side of the block before they could do homework and go play. Yeah. What I found out was my great-grandmother's hats were being bartered to this Chinese storekeeper in San Francisco. What? Yeah, so I was like, wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me they got my hats, our grandma's hats, like somewhere out in the United States. They would um, barter for like material, food. So the storekeeper would come from San Francisco, come oh. down and barter for hats and materials and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how they sustained their living, you know, wow. besides um, picking coffee, right? Yeah. So, but when no more coffee season, that's what they did. Yeah. So you said, so this, the top part of the hat is called pale. The pa. Pa. Yeah. And that's where you, so this is where you begin yeah. the hat. So actually every hat starts with a pico. Okay. And there's different styles of picos. Like this is a makamoena, indicative of um, mat weave, single mm -hmm. weave. Um, and there's different types of, of pico, like I said, but every hat starts with a pico. So we start with the pa before we bring it down on the hat block. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so you have this. We have this beautiful art piece that I see that you can probably use more every day than, <laughs> than the hat, which is beautiful. But I see that this one has color. Yeah. So you incorporate color within yeah. your, and how, how do you come about with coloring your? You know, so typically lahala actually has two different types. I mean, you have natural dark lahala. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to find. They have them as dark as like that red velvet from the red velvet yeah, cake. Yeah. That's what we call our red, our red lahala. 
And that is so hard to get, which would actually kind of look like this, this really dark brown, reddish color. But this, we used um, good old natural writ dye, <laughs> you know? And so I actually haven't experimented with natural dyes because I don't know if it'll take. Mm -hmm. um, like retaining wise. Retain the, the actual color. Yeah. But, um, so we use writ dye. Um, and typically you'll find dyed products in more contemporary pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so something like this, like this hydro flask cover, um, definitely what we want to do is we kind of want to showcase the patterns that are on, mm -hmm. which is why we use a two-tone color. Mm -hmm. Two-tone color weaving products are called unnoni. 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 Okay. Yeah, so you'll see that in hats um, as well, but those are typically the really dark brown, mm -hmm. red, chocolate col colored kind of. And w I see, so we have this table full of his papale on this side, um, and I see that black Mad Hatter looking hat, which looks really cool, I have yeah. to say. So actually, this one here um, is actually dyed as well. Um, and then I just kind of did an overlay here of the pattern so you mm -hmm. could actually see it. So um, kind of just wanting to play around with the old styles of, I guess, top hats. Yeah. yeah. So this hat will be featured in the upcoming uh, Wearable Arts Fashion Show. Right on. This and, and a few others. So just kind of playing around with it, you know. Um, Taking a look at old styles, bringing them back, mm -hmm. but using contemporary practices mm -hmm. to create the colors and stuff like that. Good, perfect segue, because my next question, which I really want to hear your mana'o on, is with a traditional practice such as weaving, mats and such, and uh, papale are more of a contemporary modern mm -hmm. piece, what is your mana'o on intertwining traditions with an innovative, more contemporary means? Um, and that's really a good question because I always have this philosophical questions with a lot of my kupuna <laughs> as well. Um, my great grandparents or my grandmother would say, you know what, if it can be woven, weave them. Mm -hmm. You know, my my manat was that in order for stuff like this to live and survive, we got to evolve with the modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the greatest um, sellers of hats are the fedora style hats, mm -hmm. um, only because it's made popular by Bruno Mars and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But this is how we attract the OPO or the youngsters to learn and carry on our practices. Mm -hmm. you know, and for us, maintaining our resources, maintaining the, the weaving practices is very important. Mm -hmm. But if we cannot attract them in, then the art is lost, right? Yeah. So, which is kind of the reason why I started weaving. Um, I noticed you know, um, in my family, only two or maybe three people were weaving. And I felt it was my kuleana Mm -hmm. to perpetuate everything that my kupuna did, mm -hmm. which is why I started really getting into it. And then as I started working with Hala, notice only plenty of makua and, and kupuna mm -hmm. yeah. are weaving. And the hardest... they're the ones who have the patience. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, <laughs> I give you big props because I know I would have a hard time at least with patience while I'm sitting there. And I tell you, it's very meditative, something. very mm -hmm. meditative. Um, and which is really interesting because the weaving part is the easiest part. Oh, really? It's the gathering, the prepping, the oh. cleaning. It's the hardest part. And again, right, so Makes when we're sense. taking a look at our kupunas going out to go maintain our trees and mm -hmm. gather, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, so any chance I get to get out there and, and gather some lohala for our kupunas, mm -hmm. I'm out there. Trust me, it's not an easy job. Yeah, so what would that entail, the prepping to make this? What does that <clears> entail? Actually, you know, it goes back to the, the maintenance of the tree and actually starting from um when the trees are cakey mm -hmm. you know lohala is very fickle and you need to tell the tree what its purpose is mm -hmm. and if you don't say that hey we're going to use you when give you junk leaves mm -hmm. so you got to go out every month you got to clean out all the, the dead leaves mm -hmm. the ones that are not good you got to kind of prune it back and only then the tree going to say okay you know what now i'm going to give you something worthy but from the time we plant one tree when when cakey it takes seven years before it can harvest good leaves oh. seven years so in and, in and of itself, that's a very long mm -hmm. process. Um, and then once you get the leaves, you know, you have two different types of varieties, one with thorns, one without thorns. Um, so that means taking out all the thorns from the leaf, which mm -hmm. means, you know, your hand get bust up um, and just softening it and just putting it into rolls and mm -hmm. just let it sit for a couple of weeks before we actually start to weave. Mm -hmm. Thornless ones are good because you don't have to take out the thorns. Yeah. But... For me, my preference is the one with the thorns. It and becomes supple. The, le the leaf to me is more leathery and supple and just kind of hardy. So I can work it, I can mm -hmm. pull it, I can tug it, and I'm not going to break. Mm -hmm. um, 
then also where the tree is is growing makes a big difference. Oh. Trees next to the ocean tend to be um, better to work with than versus trees from the mountain. The leaves okay. tend to get moldy much faster, which means you need more care. Yeah. Lahala trees need a lot of sun, an equal amount of rain, mm -hmm. um, and just a lot of TLC, because mm -hmm. otherwise you're not going to get good leaves, <laughs> trust me. Um, and you know, this hat right here actually made for my mom. This lauhala actually came from the same tree that my great-grandmother picked from in Kona. Wow. Yeah, same tree that she picked. You can tell lauhala from Kona actually because it actually has a golden buttercream color. Oh, really? Um, so the, it, it varies from yeah. because of the environment. Because of the environment. And that brings up a good point because if I find a tree that gives me red leaves, mm -hmm. If I took a keiki and planted it somewhere else, I may not necessarily get red leaves. Mm -hmm. So what I started to realize is the soils, the environment, the sun, the rain, everything play a part on what kind of leaf you can get. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very fickle. It's not just a matter of gathering leaves. You got to pick the right leaf. Yeah. Before you can actually start to. to so weed. It, like other practices, it's very much of a spiritual connection. It, it kind of is. You know, when you take a look at the word hala, right? Hala mm -hmm. means to pass or, you know, die. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I always say that Lauhala is original reuse, recycle, and repurpose material. Why else can you take this, something that's dead yeah. and bring life into it? Yeah. Where, whether it's a papale or, you know, a bottle cover, mm -hmm. mats, um, what better resource to use? Yeah, yeah. And, and just um, to point out that when, when you say Lauhala, just a quick little Olelo um, Hawaiian Educational 101, Hala, also other than the translation he gave, is the actual name of the tree. When you say lau hala, we're not talking about the tree, we're talking about the leaf, because lau itself means leaf. So lau hala means the leaf of the hala tree. Right. Just putting that out there. Well, and then, you know, as far as educational right wise, mm -hmm. the actual name for the tree is called puhala. Oh, okay. Didn't yeah. know that. So puhala is actually the name of the hala tree. Okay. The lau is the leaf from the hala tree. Okay. Yeah. And got plenty of other uses as well, like the root from the hala tree. I just learned how to make some cordage. Mm. So I've been using that to make cordage for, you know, just different types of products and yeah, projects. I, and I know on a la'au end, when the hala tree is a medicinal tree, um, the medicinal part of the tree is the roots. Yeah. But it has to be an aerial root, mm -hmm. which means that the root itself doesn't connect itself to the ground. And this is just according to the traditions that I've been learning from, um, that it's those aerial roots and what it is used for is for um, reproductive purposes for both, more specifically for men, that they would strain it and mm. they would take a drink or whatever from that. So it's a yeah. very multi-purposeful tree. And I also heard that it's also used for asthma as well. Oh, really? That same, the same part of yeah. the root is used for asthma as wow. well. So yeah. never Fair try enough. them yet, you know. Yeah. Never <laughs> try them yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I know, and you brought it up, um, the whole point of your kuleana. Yeah. What is it that really brought that responsibility aspect to your to your attention? You know, um, just a little more a little here. Growing up, um, I was really brought up in the Western way, mm -hmm. you know, going get nice corporate job and everything. And then I, when I moved back from the mainland, started really getting rooted into my culture. Mm -hmm. And then I started seeing things that were just being forgotten or, or you know, just mm -hmm. nobody practiced them anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially when taking a look at my kupuna, you know, they were kalo farmers, they're canoe carvers or hala weavers or fishermen. Um, and all the art was dying. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who's going to carry it on? So I took it upon myself as my kuleana to learn and do everything my kupuna did. Mm -hmm. So hala is just one facet of what I'm going to be working with. Um, I'm actually hoping to make my upena, my fishnet. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, that's... Yeah. Um, Something that I just want to do just because that's what both my grandfathers did. Yeah. You know, both my grandfathers were not Hawaiian, mm -hmm. but they made fishnet. So, you know, I remember them sitting down behind the door making the fishnet. Mm -hmm. um, and I just really found that, if not me, who else? Yeah. You know, so while I love weaving, I love teaching as well. I love to perpetuate the craft. Mm -hmm. um, and not just the craft, again, from the maintenance of the tree, carrying it all the way through the weaving. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's when you can do that, you can c get really good leaf um, selection mm -hmm. and your products can come out much better. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with your kuleana, what is it that, um, like the mana'o and the mo'olelo and the kauna that you put into it and your intention of what you want, you know, people to get out of it, mm -hmm. what do you put into your... your your products, like even just by designs, yeah. what, what do they speak about? 
Um, you know, actually, that's kind of what, like what you said about intentions. Mm -hmm. And so, base if I'm if I have a hat order, I actually take a look at the person's ano, and I take a look at who they are before yeah. I actually start to design a hat for them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to just make a hat for anybody. I can take a look at who they are as a person, yeah. um, and I can weave all good intentions into them. You know, and we may actually have all kinds of common patterns, but how I use the patterns and my intention for each of those mm -hmm. patterns is the mo'olala I pass on. Because um, in my weaving is my essence, my ano, mm -hmm. and all my mana go into my weaving. So when someone puts a hat onto their head, I want nothing but good mana and good mana'o going into their po'oya, mm -hmm. which is where everything's coming from. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just, just a lot of good intentions. You know, it's been very meditative, um, you know, and then just really taking a look at the relationship of plant to mm -hmm. weaving, and then just the relationships, yeah, the interrelationships. Yeah. As we're weaving, what each strand actually means. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because just, I mean, this hat in particular, and just because I would keep staring at mm -hmm. it, is so detailed, and each piece is really small. Um, and so I see also this piece next to it. Mm -hmm. What is that and what is the purpose in, yeah. in this practice for that? So typically when we um, gather our leaves, our, la our leaves are you know, quite wide. So mm -hmm. we need to cut it down so that we can actually get the strips to okay. it. So these are cutters. Um, and these two cutters in particular right here are my great grandmother's cutters. Wow. And these are my great grandmother's on my dad's side. Um, so this is actually an old spring from a Model T that they actually took and filed down wow. to um, so they, they, you literally make it? They literally made it. Now, wow, which is no interesting kidding, enough, yeah. I actually took a calibrator and I calibrated the spaces in between. And it's exactly one eighth of an inch between each of those wow. blades. And how long did it, you think, total to make this? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So it just goes to prove how long of a process this really is. Like, it's not something that you really can just go into the store and just... Well, you know, now well, we have modern-day cu uh, cutters, which yeah. we use sur surgical blades mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but when I was gifted these, I was told to bring life into them. So can I use them as museum pieces and just let them set on the yeah. shelf, you know? Because yeah. that, that's what is purpose, yeah? We yeah. bring, again, life into our, our products. Yeah, that's a good point because that, that's one thing that I've come to realize. Um, and we also did a workshop with... Uh, um, a Niihau native and his practice was making lays and one thing that he always says is that he's very happy when he actually sees people wearing the mm -hmm. lays that they make because people it's so nice that you don't want to wear it right. you don't want to destroy it you don't want to ruin it anyway so you keep it in your shelf or you keep it all right. in your jewelry box or whatever but you really don't give it any life mm -hmm. like you're saying there's no mana that you put into it so to actually have this and put it into play every day wearing your hats wearing yeah. your jewelry is a really big part Which is of the interesting practice. because there's been hats that we were able to take a look at and go, oh yeah, this is my grandma's hat. Oh yeah. So, you know, just their style, you can tell their style, their cuts, the pico, um, like, yeah, it's my grandma's hat. Wow. So to see people wear it, you know, and then not just my grandma's hat, but her sister's hat. Yeah. We can tell that, oh yeah, it's my auntie's hat. So it's good to see that people still wear them. Yeah. Uh, what's even more beautiful is every so often I, I have the, um, honor of reshaping hats that were gifted down oh, really? to people and uh, you know sometimes they get bent out of shape so I'll reshape them yeah and I've actually worked on hats that were like 50 60 70 years old oh my gosh and just taking a look at the old styles you know for me just to even touch them and just feel all that mana that goes yeah. into that it's just pretty and pretty um awesome actually wow um so and then one of the questions I ask everybody who comes into the show being it's called Aloha Authentic. Mm -hmm. In the context of Aloha, what does this practice in general, what do you think it has to offer the world when it comes to Aloha? You know, I just think um, it's just another avenue in which we can share our culture, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because I had this guy walk into a store once and actually ordered a hat from the mainland. Um, and he had saw a photo and he's like, you know, I really like this hat. Can you mm -hmm. replicate it? And for him, um, it was a reminder of his trip to Hawaii mm -hmm. um, because it was his retirement trip. Oh. And so when I actually delivered the hat, he was so happy, you know. So yeah. um, again, it's just another piece um, that we can offer to, to the world of, of who we are as a people and our culture, you know. Yeah. And then people appreciate handmade, crafted items. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you know, they're going to appreciate for a lifetime. Because like I said, I've seen hats that are 50, 60, 70 yeah. years old. And still an awesome shape. That's how I, what I really look at this practice is that you get something spiritual. You get something more unphysical that you mm -hmm. can't touch. But you also take away something physical right. that you can. So right. there's that really deeper connection to it. And um, that brings up a good point. Because like for me, when I do hats, I don't like to sell hats retail. I like to custom make them. Yeah. Which means all my mana. Yeah. And all my good thoughts are going into it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you taking a piece of me, mm -hmm. you know, wherever you go. So. Yeah, right on. Well, so you have this hat, and what are the other styles? Like, how do you come up with the design of, of the, how the hat's going to look? I mean, like, just this part of the hat is pretty cool, <laughs> you know, like, that looks like two hats put together. Yeah, this hat is actually called a cup and saucer. So when you actually turn it over, it looks like a cup that's sitting on a plate. Wow, it really is two pieces. It, then. Um, no, actually, this is one. Wow. It's woven as a single piece. And so this is actually an old style, um, indicative of like the 40s mm -hmm. and 50s um, Sunday, you know, tea hats. Yeah. Um, this is a topless hat, which, you know, no more is a top. Mm -hmm. These kind of hats are good for, uh, I, I use them for beaches and, you know, mm -hmm. like beach hats and stuff. Of course, this is for a vahine because it's got nice, you know, um, scallop edges yeah. on them. Um, how I come up with the style of the hat, this is kind of like um, a fedora hat right here. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of nice and tall. Uh, it just depends on, again, who I'm making them for. Yeah. Yeah. So as you're talking, you have this all in your head that's yeah. just starting to picture up. And One of the things that I like to do is I like to make sure that if you're going to get a hat from me, it looks like it was custom made for you, mm -hmm. that the um, it's proportionate to you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you just picked off. The, yeah. the store rack. So many yeah. times we actually put on a hat and it's like, yeah, I kind of like it, but a little bit too small, a little bit too big. Mm -hmm. um, and so by taking a look at, you know, a person's frame, mm -hmm. um, head size, I can actually make a hat that can look like it was made just for you. Wow. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. So as, as, you know, being a practitioner of this practice, where do you see our, this practice today? Like, is it growing? Is it, has it, it been like getting pushed in the back or? No, you know, honestly, um, it's actually growing. And the interesting thing is more and more men are getting interested. Yeah. Weaving typically was a vahine um, type of craft or yeah. job. The men would go gather. Um, but for some reason, men have picked it up. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot more kane getting interested, um, which is kind of surprising mm -hmm. to me, you know. Um, but we have people who are always interested in learning, mm -hmm. always. You know, whether it's just making bracelets yeah. Um, rings. That's rings. the only thing I got because it was the most patience I had at the time. <laughs> I tell you what, that's, there, that's there. difficult to make. Yeah, it really it's was. so small. And, you know, and that, that's why I look at things like this where the each strip is really small in detail compared to one that's like this bigger. Right. The tediousness that comes to the practice that you have to have mm -hmm. is just mind-boggling to me, especially when it comes to multi-things, coming up with designs. I mean, I've, I've seen other practitioners, and when they die some low and then they have some natural low and how they intertwine mm. it and the things that they come up with is just like oh my gosh I don't even know how you do that so you know I think you know, going back to your question about innovation versus you mm. know um, keeping things you know traditional um, that's where we can come in with our innovation and coming up with new design patterns mm. um, I take a look at inspiration from Aotearoa mm -hmm. from their weavers mm -hmm. from um, from Tahiti and just seeing what I can incorporate from them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's a practice, really, how I see it, that you, it, it's not just Hawaii. You really mm -hmm. get to connect with different cultures yeah. and, and relate and parallel yourself with that, to me. is. I had an honor awesome. of teaching a kupuna from Aotearoa how to make a hat, a two-tone colored hat. And wow. the day she finished and put it on, she cried. And I was like, whoa, she's like, okay, you might cool from this point <laughs> forward. Um, but, you know, once I got her started, it was all the same. Yeah. You know, so we're able to exchange ideas and patterns, um, even down to the closing of how we close hats. Mm -hmm. You know, it just made it more efficient and proficient. You know, so I just right there. Yeah. And just make things so much more easier and cleaner. So it's just that whole exchange of ideas, yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, I know the clock is clicking away and we gotta make sure I don't wanna get cut off before we finish the conversation. So Thank you very much, bro. I appreciate it very Anytime. much for coming. Thank you again for having me on it the show. It was really awesome to listen to such a traditional practice, but also more of a contemporary 
today kind of a thing and mm -hmm. you know how we can mold it in and bridge the gap between traditional and contemporary exactly. and be able to find that point of balance. Exactly. So thank you very much for sharing your perspective from the Lahala practice. Um, we're going to have another show next month, so please stay tuned. And we're going to just continue to share more of the context of what Aloha really has to offer in different avenues that our kupuna did, as well as more modern um, contemporary artists and the stories that they have to share. So as we're heading out, no worry. <laughs> next time, we'll be bringing the poi. Other and than that, po and the poke. <laughs> have a good day. Aloha. We hope. Aloha